Hello, my name is Brent Hargreaves. In our first two videos we saw that the Hittite Empire, on a par with ancient Egypt, abruptly disappeared around the year 1200 BC. We advanced a new hypothesis that the cause of this disaster was a great solar storm, which rained hard ionizing radiation down on these unfortunate people and their neighbours. Before we move on to some important facts and figures, let's take a quick look at a vivid simulation of a couple of solar storms by some talented scientists at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. The word simulation, in this case, means our best understanding of what has actually happened in the past century and a half. The images you see are the result of computer programming incorporating the very well-established laws of electromagnetism. This is not a stab at some imaginary future event, to be clear, this is no cartoon. This first simulation shows what happened during the unexceptional solar storm of December 2006, in which a burst of plasma, or charged particles, was deflected by our magnetic shield. The sun is of course out of shot to the left. The second video shows what happened in our neighbourhood in 1859 when the British astronomer Richard Carrington just happened to see through his telescope the sun launches coronal mass ejection in our direction, and we'll be coming back to that historic sighting and its earthly effects shortly. In this video, the third in the series, we'll take a look at other solar storms which left their mark on the Earth's surface. We will make a first attempt to calculate the point in the sky from which this deadly beam descended on Hatti, the land of the Hittites, and its capital Hattusha, along with the effect on its people. We'll see what historians and archaeologists have had to say about the mysterious disappearance of the strong and highly organized Hittite Empire, and we shall clarify the predictions which will either confirm or refute the Armageddon hypothesis. It is to be hoped that these predictions will be tested by scholars who have access to archaeological sites and who have access to laboratory resource. If we write about this, students of the Hittites will soon have a better idea where to look and what to look for. If the Hittite civilization really was on a par with that of Egypt, then great discoveries await us. In August 1972, the crews of US Navy warships off the coast of North Vietnam were surprised to see many magnetic sea mines explode, apparently spontaneously. They had placed them there, off the port of Hon La, as part of a trade blockade. These mines were designed to detonate upon detecting the shifting magnetic field of a passing ship, but they instead responded explosively to a shift in the Earth's magnetic field during a ground-level event, that is, the most severe class of solar storm, which had started some hours before at the Sun's surface. This event happened in between two Apollo moon missions. A few months earlier or later, the burst of high-energy protons would have been fatal to the astronauts on board. A century earlier, our unquiet sun gave an even more spectacular display of its ability to cause disruption on the Earth's surface. This is the colourful story of the first observed coronal mass ejection by British astronomer Richard Carrington, the event now being named after him. Carrington was observing the sun when a bright spot appeared on, the, on it its shape evolving before his very eyes. But let him tell the story. I hastily ran to call someone to witness the exhibition with me. On returning within 60 seconds, I was mortified to find that it was already much changed and enfeebled. He and his witness watched the bright spots contract to mere pinpoints and then disappear. 17 hours later, skies all over planet Earth erupted in red, green and purple auroras so brilliant that newspapers could be read as easily as in daylight. Stunning auroras pulsated in places as widespread as Cuba, Australia, Japan and Britain. Even more disconcertingly, telegraph systems worldwide went haywire. Even when telegraphers disconnected the batteries powering the lines, electric currents induced in the wires still allowed messages to be transmitted. Two years later, Yale professor Elias Loomis published a wonderfully thorough list of eyewitness accounts of this event. He concluded that this solar storm had compressed the Earth's magnetic field, 
causing the Earth's surface to behave like a giant dynamo, with electric current flowing along the crust. One or, two, one or two of the anecdotes gathered by Loomis are entertaining and vivid. Quote, At Boston, Massachusetts, a flame of fire burned through a dozen thicknesses of paper. The paper was set on fire and produced considerable smoke. And, quote, in Washington, D.C., a spark of fire jumped from the forehead of a telegraph operator when his forehead touched the ground wire. In fact, here are the words of the bright spark himself, Frederick W. Royce, describing his moment of fame, quote, Happening to lean towards the sounder, which is against the wall, my forehead grazed a ground wire. Immediately, I received a very severe electric shock, which stunned me for an instant. An old man who was sitting facing me, and but a few feet distance, said that he saw a spark of fire jump from my forehead to the sounder. You may be wondering whether, in the centuries before Carrington and his eventful day, there have been other such ground-level events that were not directly observed, or at least not recorded, in historical records. Well, evidence has recently emerged of a ground-level event in 660 BC, somewhat larger than the Carrington event, the trace was found in timber from a Japanese cedar, later buried by a volcano, and it was also found in ice cores extracted from a Greenland glacier. It's worth pointing out that the combination of results from these two very different sources dispel any doubt that the sudden appearance of cosmogenic nuclides was a worldwide event. The same methods have revealed GLEs in the years 774 AD and 993 AD. Such events are beginning to look like a regular occurrence. It is thought that data of this sort from tree rings and from ice cores is only 16% complete, that five-sixths of the record has yet to be catalogued, and this in turn suggests that many more such events are written in the wood and ice to be revealed when the effort is made to find them. If the Armageddon event did indeed wipe out the Hittites, there will be evidence in the tree rings and ice cores from 1200 BC. These will be in the form of radionuclides carbon-14 and beryllium-10. These, if they are found, will match the chlorine-36 written in the rocks of Hattusha, as mentioned in the previous video. If found, they will prove the Armageddon hypothesis. We'll be moving on in just a moment to the effects of radiation on people and on other life forms. But first, here is a brief reminder of the great civilization which was snuffed out by the Armageddon event of 1200 BC. The relics they left behind are of course just one aspect of what was lost. The statues, the clay tablets, the city walls, these can only represent a fraction of the Hittite civilization. Did they have agriculture? Did they have art, including music? Did they have medicine? Of course they did, in one form or another. If they had state-of-the-art chariot, chariots and the tactical ability to fight the mighty Egyptian army to a strategically important draw, which they did, we can infer that behind this sharp spear tip lay a whole infrastructure of crafts and wealth and research and development. Here are a few of the comments written by scholars in recent years. Some of them have attempted to explain them the mystery. Most of them openly admit to their being baffled. One such example is Dr. Trevor Bryce in his authoritative book, The Kingdom of the Hittites. Bryce says that, quote, in attempting to find reasons for the collapse of the Hittite kingdom, we should be careful not to give undue prominence to any specific set of factors, whether internal or external. And then goes on to say that, when considering also the Mycenaean collapse, we must at present avoid the temptation of devising too precise a set of common factors to explain the pattern of events in both regions in this period." Unquote. Andreas muller Karper of Philips University Marburg wrote that, quote, The question why all these Hittite centers found their end at about the same time remains unanswered. Unquote. Given the worldwide fascination with ancient Egypt, the academic and financial resource devoted to it over the last two centuries has been substantial, and rightly so. If Hattie were to attract a similar level of interest, what wonders may we discover in coming decades?
In our previous video on this subject, the work of Dr. Naki Akjar was mentioned. His 2009 paper describes the analysis of surface samples taken from the Acropolis above Hattusha. The analysis quantified the chlorine-36 in each sample created by cosmic rays. This table shows the effects of these rays on each sample. The expectation was exposure times of the order of 3,200 to 3,500 years, that is, from the time of Hattusha's abandonment to today. Instead, values of 19.6 thousand, 24.1 thousand, and 51.9 thousand years were found, far in excess of expectation. This sketch shows in simplified form the orientations of the three samples. The first from the roughly horizontal bedrock platform, the second from the roughly east-facing boundary wall, and the third from the roughly west-facing wall. Dr. Akjar's team, in common with all practitioners of the science of geochronology, assume that galactic cosmic rays arrive from random directions at a steady rate. If, however, the source of the unexpectedly high chlorine-36 concentrations were from a specific direction in the sky, the orientation of these three samples would become a key factor in the three very different doses received. At its simplest, rock surfaces perpendicular to rays would have a greater exposure than those struck at an oblique angle, and there are obvious parallels here with the optimal sighting of solar panels. Assuming that a parallel beam of neutrons struck Hattusha from a specific point in the sky, and assuming that the sampled surfaces were precisely horizontal and vertical, we can deduce a number of things. Firstly, the western facing wall was more exposed than the eastern. Secondly, the western facing wall was more exposed than the horizontal bedrock. It's important at this point to note that cosmic rays have such penetrating power that approximately, approximately one third of them make it down to a meter below the surface. This being the case, being on the leeward side, the protected side of a meter thick wall would give only partial protection. The western facing sample contains a much higher chlorine 36 concentration than its eastern facing counterpart, and we therefore propose that the hypothesized neutron beam approached from the west, its eastern facing counterpart receiving an attenuated dose, partially protected by its one meter thickness. This scenario can be confirmed or refuted with the greatest of ease. If it's correct, then the readings from the opposite side, that is the inner side of the west facing wall, will be half the size of the readings already obtained and the inner side of the east-facing wall will be double those obtained on the outer side. If we now put hat 2a to one side and just compare hat 3a with hat 1a, the implication is that the neutron beam arrived from low above the horizon and not from on high. Although the orientation of each of these samples was not recorded with great precision, the data currently at hand suggests that the deadly beam arrived from 20 degrees above the western horizon. We shall now make a first attempt to quantify the amount of radiation which appears to have destroyed the people of Hattie. There are many uncertainties here, but let's start with one measurable fact. The surface layer of Hattusha's rocks contain a million atoms per gram of chlorine-36, and each one of those atoms is the result of impact by neutron or muon. The Akjar paper includes a graph showing how cosmic rays penetrate the surface of limestone. This is sometimes termed an attenuation curve. Approximately half the neutrons which reach the surface make it to a depth of 75 centimetres, and approximately a quarter make it to twice that depth, to 150 centimetres. The expression half-depth is not current, but seems to be a useful term in this context of exponential decline by distance. 
It's worth noting that Dr. Akjar's team took surface samples. They were not equipped with drilling equipment capable of extracting drill cores from five meters down. The graph shown is based on well-established geochronology theory and practice. Digressing for just a moment from the Hittites, a similar analysis was done in Japan on a stone tomb just 107 meters below the hypocenter of the Hiroshima bomb. The stone from which this tomb was made was a little denser than Hattusha's limestone, but the fast neutrons hitting that tomb were attenuated at about the same half distance, about 80 centimeters. Just as with Hattusha's rocks, the effect of fast neutrons was to transmute some calcium-40 atoms into chlorine-36. We can attempt to estimate the flux of neutrons which demonstrably have transformed atoms in Hattusha's limestone. At the surface, there have been a million such strikes per gram, and that gram can be imagined as a top cuboid in a centimetre square column. 75 centimetres down, that concentration will be half that, and at a depth of 150 centimetres, a quarter of a million per gram. Totting up these scores, layer by layer, we can estimate that some 250 million chlorine-36 atoms per square centimetre have been created by the Earth-penetrating neutrons, which are secondary cosmic rays. Radiation of this intensity is of no great hazard to life, but this calculated number is about to rise. The transformed nuclides are due to neutron impacts with calcium nuclei, which are tiny in comparison with the whole calcium atom. A reasonable metaphor would be an archery contest in which only bullseyes are recorded. It's obvious that many more arrows have been shot by the archer, with many more misses than hits. But this metaphor is of limited use because a fast neutron passing through the first calcium atom on the surface of Hattusha's red bedrock, having passed by the nucleus, will have many more opportunities to strike a nucleus as it continues its downward journey. We must here distinguish between direct impacts and glancing blows. Physicists refer to these two types as inelastic and elastic scattering. The glancing blows, each of which slows the neutron down, are much more common than the direct hits which produce a chlorine atom from the original calcium target. This paper from the Journal of Neutron Research gives a ratio of somewhere between a hundred and a thousand fold. This means that the radiation intensity measured at Hattusha is not 250 million neutrons per square centimetre, but between 25 and 250 billion. What would be the effect on a person subjected to such a burst of radiation? Nuclear safety authorities, in assessing risks and exposures and effects on people, use the unit of the grey, a quantifiable unit of biological radiation hazard. A thousandth of a gray is a milligray. This paper by NASA tells us that a hundred million fast neutrons per square centimeter will expose a person to f a four milligray dose. Upscale this a little and we have 250 million neutrons giving a 10 milligray dose. This table shows a wide range of such exposures and their consequences. At the trivial end of the spectrum, we have a radiation dose when a patient is scanned in the radiology department of a hospital, 8 milligrays. Next step up is the amount of radiation a worker in a nuclear power station is allowed in a year of his or her career, 20 milligrays. At the opposite end of this spectrum of risk is the dose received by the most resilient survivor of the Hiroshima bomb, 6,000 milligrays. If Apollo 16 had taken place in August 1972 instead of April, or if Apollo 17 had taken place in August 1972 instead of December, their crews, shielding behind 0.3 millimeters of aluminium, would have received a lethal dose of 56,000 milligrays. 
to return to the unfortunate Hittites, if we're right that they were assaulted by a neutron storm which sent between 25 and 250 billion neutrons through every square centimeter of their bodies, this equates to a dose of between 1,000 and 10,000 milligrays. The tragic comparison is that this was rather worse than witnessing the Hiroshima bomb from close up. We'll end this video now, but here's a concise summary of what has been covered. Number one, the mighty Hittite Empire disappeared abruptly around the year 1200 BC to the bafflement of historians. Number two, in the hypothesis presented here, the cause was a great solar storm which struck the eastern Mediterranean. Number three, such solar storms affect the Earth's surface many times a century, and particularly violent ones every century or two. Number four, the solar cosmic rays which struck Hatti, the land of the Hittites, left a clear trace in the rocks of Hattusha, their capital. This is written in the form of cosmogenic nuclide chlorine-36, which is only caused by the impact of cosmic rays on calcium-40. And one gram of Hattusha's surface bedrock contains a million such atoms. Number five, this million fast neutrons, of which we have direct evidence, was accompanied by millions more which hit subsurface calcium nuclei, and by billions more not absorbed by the tiny calcium nuclei, but which would have passed through the fragile and vulnerable bodies of the Hittites and their livestock, and also through their crops and food reserves. It's to be hoped that in the coming years, academics will make an attempt to refute this hypothesis or confirm it. If confirmed, the directional data written in Hattusha's rocks will be confirmed with great precision. Not only will the claim that the cosmic rays arrived from a point in the sky 20 degrees above the horizon be firmed up, but the azimuth also, that is the compass bearing, which at present seems to be west or southwest. If confirmed, the same directional signal should be sought in other sites in Anatolia and in the ancient sites of Mycenae and Greece, which also collapsed at the end of the Bronze Age 3,200 years ago.